Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's three o'clock, and I am under strict orders to maintain time for this last panel of the afternoon. My name is Jessica Byron. I'm from the Department of Government, and I'm going to be chairing this panel. Um, we have two speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Harshan Kumara Singham. He is Smuts Research Fellow in Commonwealth Studies at the University of Cambridge and Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, University of London. He has also held an Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship Award at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. His work covers comparative politics and how the Westminster system was exported across the world. And his publications include a monograph, A Political Legacy of the British Empire, Power and the Parliamentary System in Post-Colonial India and Sri Lanka, published in 2013, and Onward with Executive Power, Lessons from New Zealand, published in 2010. He is currently editing a book on constitution making in Asia, decolonization and state building in the aftermath of the British Empire. And Dr. Kumara Singham will be speaking on reforms and regrets, lessons from the new Westminsters. Our second speaker is Dr. Derek O'Brien, who started out studying English and philosophy and then converted to law. Um, he worked as a solicitor for a number of years in private practice before um, lecturing at the University of Westminster and then moving to Cayman Islands Law School. And he is now with the law department of Oxford Brooks um, for several years. His main research area is the constitutional law of the Commonwealth Caribbean and the constitutional implications for economic integration within this region. He is also interested in the operation of legal systems within small jurisdictions, and he is one of the founding members of the Small Jurisdictions Project at Oxford Brookes University. Each speaker will have 20 minutes, after which for the last 20 minutes, we will allow questions for about 10 minutes, and then I will give each speaker five minutes to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Brian and Kate, for taking the risk and inviting a non-Caribbeanist uh, to be here. Uh, but I'm very, very pleased to be here to talk, hopefully from a broader perspective of the Westminster uh, model itself. So as you know better than I do, uh, Portia Simpson Miller used her January 6, 2012 address to the Jamaican people to state the wish to, be, the wish to become a republic. And she said, I love the Queen, but I think time come. <laughs> Uh, echoing perhaps some of the words of Michael Manley in 1975. But interestingly, this, 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 this importance of uh, changing a very important colonial legacy of having the Queen as uh, head of state, which uh, Richard mentioned, but it's interesting how little, I will, at least from what I could see, there was to actually change uh, Jamaica's Westminster system. There wasn't, that, that argument wasn't evident at least from what I uh, saw. Jamaica arguably is a Westminster state par excellence, a ceremonial head of state, an appointed Senate, a lower house elected by a majoritarian electoral system, a two-party system, a white, the Whitehall model for the bureaucracy, an independent ju judiciary, and, and most importantly, and as we've discussed in the previous panel, an executive drawn from the legislature and headed by a Prime Minister who has the support of the majority of the popular elected uh, chamber, making the, tra the traditional Westminster case of a powerful executive that is especially supreme after an election victory. 
After Mrs. Simpson Miller's uh, statement, Buckingham Palace issued, as it always does on these uh, occasions when republics are mentioned, that, uh, and where she's head of state, the Queen is head of state, the issue was entirely a matter for the Jamaican government and people. So beyond being just a formulaic uh, response, this articulates the p position and veracity that executive power uh, was long before delegated from London to the local executive. So this was Jamaica's choice, not something imposed uh, from London. So new Westminster, so Westminster's beyond uh, that, uh, that, in, that in London, constitutes is what uh, Guillermo uh, O'Donnell has said, often adopted without much variation the institutional ensembles already familiar to them from the formal or informal empire to which they belonged. So this is obviously in the case in the uh, Caribbean. And interestingly to note, as people have already said, changing to a republic doesn't necessarily change any of these dynamics uh, that are here. So and, and, and of course, in the Caribbean is literally a sea of realms surrounded by republics to the north and republics uh, to the south. And turning to the first republic in the Commonwealth, India, which did have a constituent assembly, uh, unlike most of the Commonwealth uh, cases, nonetheless, over, its elite overwhelmingly went for uh, the traditional Westminster-style cabinet government, a ceremonial head of state, a powerful executive center that dominated uh, the regions, uh, a common law system. But the one important difference, which was uh, not evident at that time, was having a, uh, a fundamental, fundamental rights for its um, uh, citizens and looked and debated all the other models, including Gandhi's model of village republics and the American model, the Swiss model, which we heard about today, uh, and, uh, and other uh, causes, but Nehru, uh, similar to many, in many ways to the other independence leaders from the Caribbean, was uh, enamored with its own, his own particular interpretation to the Westminster model. The other, another republic uh, from the region, uh, Sri Lanka, which uh, the Ceylon model was seen as the, was the model for the order and council in Jamaica in 1962, uh, has went from another type of republic, went in 1972, became a parliamentary republic, 78 a, presid a executive presidency, and now interestingly is trying to go back to becoming a Westminster parliamentary state after the excesses of its executive. So I just mentioned this since the republics and executive presidencies aren't necessarily uh, the obvious answer. So the Westminster system, of course, has become the most exported political model, and with it uh, was seen the same problems of a deficit uh, in executive accountability that in most cases, as, as we've heard today, especially in the Caribbean, is more pronounced than in London. Though it is recognized by scholars like Patrick Weller the powers of the Prime Minister or Parliament, uh, the role of political parties and all the other basic questions asked about the British political system could be studied in settings as different as Canberra, New Delhi, Ottawa, as well as Westminster, and I would say as well as Kingston. Countries beyond naturally lacked, end of quote, lacked the length and sometimes the strength of political evolution that Britain can claim over that long period of time. The countries that left the colonial embrace had what Sir Kenneth Weir described as constitutional autochthony, providing a local form and response to local needs since the flexibility of the Westminster system readily allows such local interpretations and modifications, perhaps more than many, any other system. The studied ambiguity of the British system was obviously unable to have the same uh, centuries of development that occurred in Britain uh, to, to work in the same way outside. The British system is arguably effective not for its checks and balances, but instead for the political and informal ones. The effective checks and balances could not be exported, but only developed. And I would uh, say in, in, some, in terms of the other panel earlier, in some ways, taking on the Westminster system was in some ways an assertion of power of taking on the system themselves and running it themselves rather than, a system, than an assertion of submission to a colonial system.
1976, Lord Helsham famously spoke of the elective dictatorship that, described, that he was describing the British parliamentary system. This evocative phrase had many antecedents and examples of its meaning could be found, of course, well beyond the Palace of Westminster. Helsham, a former Lord Chancellor and Cabinet Minister, quipped that under the British system, you can live under an elective dictatorship which is absolute in theory, if hitherto thought tolerable in practice. Halsham, who had been a contender, of course, to succeed Howard Macmillan in 1963, pointed to not only the lack of judicial restraints on the sovereignty of Parliament, but also the fact that in practice Parliament uh, had, had been subordinated to Cabinet and indeed to the, a powerful minority within Cabinet. The whole absolute powers of Parliament are wielded by Cabinet alone and sometimes to a relatively small group within, the within Cabinet, his words. The executive in that, that, that sense became an instrument uh, of the, uh, an instrument, sorry, of this elective dictatorship since there is very little, if any, horizontal accountability uh, of the executive to the judiciary or the legislature without having the executive centred on a single person politically and constitutionally, as in presidential executives, the Westminster system instead allows conditions of horizontal accountability within uh, the executive to stymie, if you like, a personless delegative democracy perhaps seen in the South, South American cases in the past. However, there is, of course, a powerful uh, prime minister that dominates the system. A few years later, after Halsham said that, he said, I'm sure what Britain needs is a new constitution. I'm sure that it, would, it should be of the written or controlled variety and that it should therefore contain entrenched clauses if it is, if it is at all possible to bring this about. The object of this, such a constitution should be to instit institutionalize a theory of limited government. However, despite Halsham's despair of the Palace of Westminster, uh, the, sorry, in, uh, Britain still has very strong conventions and strong institutions that have developed over centuries to mitigate some of the excesses of the executive. This, in, this is due arguably to the gradualist political change that happens from the original Westminster. The UK, of course, if, you, if we're using its modern name, uh, was, was a monarchy before it became a constitutional monarchy. It was a constitutional monarchy became befo before it became a system of government built around ministers of the crown. And it was a system of government built around ministers of the crown before it became a parliamentary system. And it was a parliamentary system before it became a parliamentary democracy. So this is where, over a very long uh, period of time. And the UK itself, of course, is no longer, if it ever was, the model uh, to follow. And Britain now, of course, its politics are very different from those of uh, uh, the Caribbean. As we can see now in Britain, there is now a coalition government which, uh, between the Conservatives and the Lib Dems after the May 2010 uh, UK general election. And this, in fact, uh, highlights a trend that has already been evident in other Commonwealth states and i.e. having more than one party sitting at the cabinet table. However, this has not ended the power of the executive and its power over the legislature. Evidence from minority and coalition governments from New Zealand, Canada, India and Australia, for example, have shown this has not altered the executive reality. As one recent report from the Constitution Unit in London has said, that long entrenched prerogative powers allow governments and Westminster systems to retain control of vital areas such as fiscal policy, foreign and security affairs, even when a minority government. Um, looking back to the, these new Westminsters, which I have described in, uh, elsewhere, uh, the, empire, the British Empire's colonial thank you, a legacy meant that institutions and conventions, as well as governments, whether self governing or with sufferance from the imperial center, obviously lacked the same parliamentary hist history and political evolution. This would arguably mean a greater need for limited government since it lacked the above phases of democratic evolution over centuries 
instead of having to, like Macmillan, Lennox Boyd, Bustamante, and Manley, to negotiate independence within a matter of months and give sovereign independence after centuries of autocratic rule in places like the West Indies. However, the real difficulty would be for local leaders to deal and develop this awesome legacy from day one of independence. Um, the newly independent polities that succeeded the colonial autocracy were obviously influenced by the power structures and practices of the departing regime. The regime's formal accountability had previously been to London and now this would be transferred to a local electorate. The real power in the process of democratization in fact lay with the leaders to whom power and authority had been transferred rather than the electorate itself. The disjointed nature of this change created situations where accountabilities were ambiguous in a context that included nation building, battles for political ascendancy, and a lack of practice conventions in, an, in the nascent era following uh, self-rule. Coming back to the executive, a state, in, of course, is nothing without sovereignty. In a democracy, the fundamental principle is that sovereignty derives from the people. The chain of delegation of sovereignty from citizens to government is the essence of this democracy. However, contemporary monarchical democracies like these uh, here in the Caribbean provide a con conundrum to this theory. As a feature of both its antecedents and modern development, monarchical democracies in the Westminster cases uniquely derive sovereignty from the monarch as well as from the people, a sovereignty from above and below. Therefore, monarchical democracies have these two sh chains of delegations and their executives must contend with both delegations of power for their existence. This is, there is, of course, a lot of an analysis from the an, uh, chain of delegation from citizens, uh, the indirect chain from citizens to, to the government, but less from the monarch or its successor to uh, the executive. And in many ways, the great power of the executive uh, is, uh, is the key, exec uh, key prerogatives it has uh, in, in, in modern politics, rely, in fact, relies on monarchical delegation. The process of the executive's expropriation of monarchical powers, but nonetheless the retention of monarchical form, has often, often been a disguised and ignored uh, development especially since so much of this is based on convention, not law and articles, or even a codified uh, nature. And this has led to uh, many uh, political science scholars, for example, rejecting the concept of even presidentialization of politics and more saying it's actually more correct to say a prime ministerialization of politics and power because prime ministers are actually more powerful in their context than a president uh, say in the States is. Um, and, 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 but arguably this delegation of power from above to prime ministers through evolution and usurpation has been, a, has been critical to this political and cultural shift. This is arguably the monarchization uh, where heads of government exercise considerable powers based on ambiguous conventions and regal and colonial uh, legacies. Just looking very briefly at Canada uh, to the north here, just where this, is, could, is a, where this has happened in practice. In uh, 2008, uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper uh, um, was, a was able to convince the Governor General to prorogue Canada's, Canada's uh, Parliament uh, to avoid a hostile opposition vote of no confidence showed the problems uh, that the executive was always accountable to the legislature and the convention that the head of state is kept out of contentious political decisions. The danger in my belief is that lies in the use and interpretation of conventions. Uh, as, as one Canadian scholar has argued, according to one set of precedents, the Governor General should never refuse the Prime Minister's request for proroguing Parliament, while another set of precedents indicate the opposite. Uh, that a prorog proroguing of Parliament should never be granted to escape a vote of confidence. These contentions, of course, are not based on law but convention, and thus in the situation, the question whether the Queen of Canada's 
representative made the right decision is hotly disputed. Whatever else, the interpretation by the Crown showed how the royal prerogatives can be engaged by the executive for political purposes, whether warranted uh, or not. The Westminster system bearing a common colonial legacy of vague accountabilities and creates a fertile ground for executive do dominance. Theoretically, as we've heard, the executive is led by a prime minister and cabinet served at the head of state's pleasure and accountable for their policies uh, in the legislature while their actions are, were governed by sacrosanct conventions. In practice, however, uh, the prime minister and cabinet exercises full powers and prerogatives invested in the crown or constitution without hindrance from the head of state. Parliament was dominated uh, by a governing par party and conventions could be surrendered to real politique, allowing opportunities, opportunities for extraordinary misuse of executive power over other branches uh, of the electorate. Uh, in New Zealand, my country, uh, in, in uh, trying to change this in the 90s was taking on the mixed member proportional system. And though this has brought on a greater level of representation in the New Zealand Parliament, it has actually not changed how the executive operates. The executive still works in a much the way, same way it had in the first past the post system in the, in the uh, era uh, before. In response to the rumblings over his pre predecessor's creative constitutionalism and executive power, Gordon Brown and Jack Straw published a green paper in July 2007 which outlined, outlined some recommendations which would restrict executive power to the benefit of Parliament. The British, British Prime Minister, like Westminster equivalents, exercises authority in the name of the monarch without the people and the elected representatives and their people being consulted. They made some, made some recommendations which I'll quickly outline here. The royal prerogative powers exercised by the Prime Minister should be put on a statutory basis and brought under stronger parliamentary scrutiny and control. Development of a convention where the government could not proceed with the deployment of armed forces without the approval of the House of Representatives. The Prime Minister would require the approval of the House of Representatives before asking the Governor-General for a dissolution. That a majority of MPs could request a recall, uh, a recall of the House to the Speaker, including in cases where the government itself had not recommended it. It also outlined the, ne the need, uh, need to enhance public confidence and trust in the Office of the Attorney General as the Chief Legal Advisor to the Crown and role as the guardian of the public interest. This could be by having the Attorney General not being a senior member of the Executive, attending Cabinet only when legal issues were directly concerned and also having uh, greater transparency and consultation uh, and increasing Parliament's role over major public appointments that are carried out by, the, uh, by executive instruction and for certain appointments where appropriate, uh, the government nominee would be subject to a pre-appointment hearing in an appropriate select committee. Though Brown's Green Paper uh, for Britain did not make direct proposals for changing the Queen's personal and constitutional prerogatives of reserve uh, powers, instead concentrating on those that the government exercised in her name, I think it is useful to reform those ancient prerogatives as well, not necessarily to remove them, but to strengthen uh, a Governor-General's authority over them, as be, has been discussed before. Uh, as, as is the five main powers of a head of gov Westminster head of state are to appoint a prime minister, to dismiss a prime minister, to refuse to dissolve parliament, to force a dissolution of parliament, and to refuse assent uh, to legislation. These are all, or at least if the situation is not clear, controversial and critical powers. However, a governor general in such situations where the decision is far from obvious or where he or she is unsure as to the uh, validity of the choice, is compelled to make decisions with minimal consultation uh, and opportunity for engagement. The Governor-General, the exercise of the reserve powers, making other judgments concerning such responsibilities as crown appointments, which we've discussed before, and honours, as we discussed also, could rely instead, as has now been 
discuss in Australia of a Council of State to assist and add credence to the Governor General's choices, which, it would argue, uh, which act like, as Bruce Ackerman has described, as an integrity branch to help as, a, as another branch to check the executive's uh, powers. This time, in, in conclusion, uh, this, 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 the Westminster system allowed countries, and the executive in particular, especially the Prime Minister, the ability to mould and establish constitutional traditions, which in turn fostered itself upon the na a nascent polity that surrounded the real and constitutional independence in places like the Caribbean. This ability comes from the Westminster inheritance that so many states were bequeathed. The flags have gone, the proconsuls forgotten, and British rule confined to a few pages in the national history books, but the Westminster legacy of executive power remains. Norman Girvin, in his London uh, talk to us, said, Westminster, the Westminster system is about entrenching the status quo. I mean, and I think he also meant that power uh, in the Westminster system allows power once granted is very easy, is very difficult to give up. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to um, echo Harshan's thanks to uh, Brian and Kate um, for, in, for inviting me to speak here, but in my case the risk was in inviting a lawyer uh, to come to speak to you. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to be making this presentation to an audience that includes uh, a number of distinguished constitutional scholars who have informed my own work, and I'm thinking in particular here I can see Dr. Hamid Ghani, uh, Professor Selwyn Ryan, uh, Cynthia Barrow-Giles, and if he'd been here, I'd have included uh, Professor Trevor Monroe. Um, I say it's a pleasure, but it's, uh, it's also actually um, terrifying, but there we go. Um, the, today, I'm, obviously, we're, we're talking about um, Westminster in the uh, Caribbean, and um, uh, the, the criticisms of uh, Commonwealth Caribbean parliaments are, are legion, and we've, we've heard uh, a number of them today. And, but most of them tend to focus on the relationship between uh, parliament and the executive, and the way that executives dominate uh, parliaments and impair parliament's ability to hold the executive to account. Uh, in my presentation, I want to talk about parliament's relationship with a different branch of government, and that's uh, Parliament's relationship with the judiciary in the Commonwealth Caribbean. Um, under the Westminster model, that relationship is supposed to be governed uh, by what's called the principle of comity. Uh, that is a, a spirit of mutual respect which requires uh, that neither uh, parliaments nor the judges intrude too far into each other's respective constitutional spheres. Um, and I want to look at how that principle of comity is reflected in the relationship between Commonwealth Caribbean parliaments and Commonwealth Caribbean courts uh, by looking at recent judicial developments in two areas. One is amendments to the Constitution and the other is the relationship between laws made by national parliaments and um, uh, the regional court, the Caribbean uh, Court of Justice. And in looking at these developments, I want to uh, look at them through the lens of two competing visions of democracy, um, which I'll call political constitutionalism and legal constitutionalism. Th these terms would be immediately familiar to anyone uh, who's familiar with um, constitutional theory, but just uh, a brief word by way of explanation, what do I mean? Uh, when I'm using these terms. Sorry? There we go. Sorry, I was holding that upside down. Okay, <laughs> political constitutionalism. Um, political constitutionalists believe that representative democracy is the paramount principle in the Constitution. 
Uh, they believe that in, within a democracy, the political process is the most legitimate means of holding uh, authority to account. They believe that the political process is the best deterrent to unconstitutional behavior by those in authority, either because uh, the government risks losing a vote of confidence in uh, the assembly if they act unconstitutionally, or uh, they risk uh, losing uh, the next general election. They also argue that the political process is the best corrective, because if they do behave unconstitutionally, they'll be kicked out uh, by the electorate at the uh, next election. Legal constitutionalists, however, uh, place the emphasis elsewhere. Uh, they place their faith in the judicial rather than the political system uh, in order to hold uh, authority to account. And they underpin uh, their case by both philosophical and practical arguments. Philosophically, what they will say is that uh, there are a set of higher order uh, legal principles that are so fundamental uh, that they are, in effect, immutable. So that if Parliament were to enact a law which contradicted those fundamental legal principles, uh, the courts would not be obliged to uphold those laws. In practical terms, uh, legal constitutionalists would argue uh, that because of the executive dominance of the Parliament, you need an ex a body that is external to Parliament, i.e. the courts, uh, to hold uh, authority to account. Okay, I want to uh, see how both of these competing visions uh, play out uh, in the context of the Commonwealth Caribbean uh, in these two areas. Um, so I'll begin with amendments to the Constitution, and I want to really focus in just on two recent judgments of the Supreme Court of Belize. Now, though they're modelled on the UK Parliament, of course, Commonwealth Caribbean parliaments don't have the legislative supremacy that's traditionally associated with the UK Parliament. They are instead subject to the Constitution. So what does this mean in practice? Uh, what does it entail in terms of their lawmaking powers? The first case I want to look at is Bowen and the Attorney General of Belize, uh, a case from 2009. Um, this case concerned the desire of the government of Belize to exploit the recent discovery of petroleum and mineral uh, deposits in that country. And what they wanted to do was compulsorily acquire all of these uh, petroleum and min mineral deposits in the name of the state. Now, that in itself wasn't legally objectionable. They could have done that. What was objectionable was the way that they set about amending the Constitution. Um, because in addition to bringing these assets into public ownership, they amended Section 17 of the Constitution, uh, which 17.1 is the part of the Constitution that protects the right to property. Now, in order to amend the Constitution, they had to comply with Section 69, so they had to secure the vote of three quarters of the members of the House of Assembly. And they could do that because at the most recent general election, the UDP, the United Democratic Party, had won 25 out of the 31 seats in the general election. So they had no problem getting a three quarters majority in Parliament. The effect of the amendment was twofold. One, it meant that the, the private owners or, public or community owners of petroleum and mineral uh, rights could not apply to the courts to determine whether their acquisition by the government was lawful. It also deprived the owners uh, of petroleum and mineral from going to the courts and asking the courts to determine what compensation uh, they should be paid for the compulsory acquisition of their assets. Okay, so that was the uh, challenge that was presented to the court in Bowen. Uh, obviously, the lawyers for the government argued, well, we've done everything by the board. Uh, we've introduced this uh, amendment to the Constitution. We've got a vote of three-quarters majority in the House of Assembly, and therefore there's no argument uh, that can be made to that. However, the amendment was struck down by the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Conti, on the basis that the amendment to the Constitution violated the basic structure of the Constitution. <coughs> They may have got a three-quarters majority vote, but that was just a mere procedural handbook. Uh, 
Uh, that did not entitle them to change the basic structure of the Constitution. Now, the, the difficulty that I have with this judgment is what is the basic structure of the Constitution? What, what on earth does that phrase mean? Um, according to Chief Justice Conte, um, it means the fundamental rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, it also includes the ideas, desires, and beliefs of the people of Belize as enshrined in the preamble to the Constitution. And it also includes certain implied principles in the Constitution, such as the rule of law and the separation of powers. Uh, the fact that the uh, government were trying to bypass the ability of the courts to determine the legitimacy of this acquisition or to determine the compensation that should be paid to uh, these landowners uh, violated both of those principles. Okay, the second case that I want to look at is very much a sequel to the Bowen case. Um, different judge, but again, it's the Supreme Court of Belize, and the facts are relatively similar. It's British Caribbean Bank Limited and the Attorney General of Belize. Again, it's the UDP government. Uh, on this occasion, they wanted to compulsorily acquire the interests of British Caribbean Bank Limited in a company called the Belize Telecommunications Limited, which was the major provider of telecommunications in Belize. So in order to, and this was part of a wider program to bring all the public utilities in Belize into state ownership. So in order to uh, acquire the, the British Caribbean Banks Limited interest in uh, the company, they passed the Belize Telecommunications Amendment Act of 2009, the 2009 uh, Act. Now, that act was struck down by the Court of Appeal of Belize. They uh, held that the acquisition uh, of the claimant's interest in uh, the company was not for a lawful uh, purpose. And they also held that it violated Section 17 of the Constitution because it had made no provision uh, for the principles for compensation to be paid uh, to British Caribbean Bank Limited. Undeterred, however, almost the next day, the government of Belize rushed through the Belize Telecommunications Amendment Act of 2011, which was virtually identical to the 2009 Act, except they uh, jiggled around with the wording and tried to ensure that the stated purpose of the acquisition was a public uh, purpose uh, in accordance with the recommendations of the Court of Appeal. But to put the subject beyond any doubt at all, and remembering what had happened in the case of Bowen, they decided also at the same time to amend the Belize uh, Constitution. They wanted to preempt any constitutional challenge whatsoever to their uh, acquisition of the telecommunications industry. Now, the, the effect of the Eighth Amendment Act was threefold. Firstly, it vested the ownership <coughs> of all public u utilities in Belize in the government and declared it that it was for a public purpose. Secondly, they, dis they disapplied the supreme law clause of the Constitution to laws that had achieved this three-quarters majori three majority in the House of Assembly. In other words, once a law had a three-quarters majority, it could never have been struck down as not being subject to the Constitution. And finally, they said that apart from the procedural requirements of Section 69, courts could not strike down any other law enacted by Parliament on either procedural or substantive uh, grounds. However, uh, the Eighth Amendment, like the Sixth Amendment before it, was struck down by the Supreme Court of Belize on the grounds that it again violated the basic structure of the Constitution. Um, in fact, in the second case, in the British Caribbean Bank Limited case, the Supreme Court of Belize went even further than the court had in Bowen. Because in Bowen, the court had said it may be possible for Parliament to amend even the basic structure of the Constitution if it says, if the governing party says it's going to do so in its manifesto prior to an election, or if it puts the amendment to the vote of the people in a referendum. 
then in those circumstances we would uh, tolerate an amendment of the basic structure of the Constitution. In the second case of British Caribbean Banks Limited, they said, no, the basic structure of the uh, Constitution, the principles that are outlined in the preamble, must be preserved forever. They can never be changed by Parliament. Okay, the second area that I wanted to look at was the relationship between national law and what I'm calling community law. So by community law, I mean the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. So that is the treaty that founds the Caribbean single market and economy, and to the decisions that are taken by the competent organs of CARICOM. So I'm calling that, that body of law, community law. And I want to look at it uh, by reference to a recent case of the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is Myrie and Barbados, which I imagine is familiar very familiar to all of you uh, in this room. I mean, just briefly, the facts were that it was a Jamaican national, Miss Myrie, who turned up at the airport at Barbados, who was refused entry by the immigration authorities and then promptly deported back to Jamaica. Upon her return to uh, Jamaica, Miss Murray found some lawyers and they uh, filed a challenge uh, before the Caribbean Court of Justice and they argued that her deportation uh, violated a decision of the heads of government of CARICOM that was taken back in July 2007. And that decision was that all CARICOM, the nationals or the citizens of all CARICOM states should be free to enter any other uh, member state within CARICOM and to reside there for a period of up to six months. Okay, so that was the decision of the heads of government. The, what was the legal status of that decision? The legal status of these decisions are governed uh, by Article 240 of the revised treaty, and I'm going to take them in uh, reverse order. Uh, by Article 240 uh, 2, the member states of CARICOM have entered into an undertaking that they will immediately give effect in their national laws to the decisions taken by the heads of government at the regional conference. That's undercut a little bit, though, by Article 241, which says until that happens, until the uh, decisions are incorporated in the domestic laws of the member states, um, the citizens of the member states have enjoy no legally binding rights arising from these uh, decisions. So the traditional understanding was these decisions uh, could not be enforced by individuals. But the Caribbean Court of Justice sorry, in uh, Myri turned that understanding absolutely on its head. What they said was, okay, the way we read Article 240 is, yes, the decisions cannot be enforced by individuals at the national level, but they can be enforced by individuals at the regional level in proceedings directly before the Caribbean Court of Justice. Um, now, that decision is remarkable on at least two levels. One is um, that it means uh, that there is another lawmaking body uh, within the Commonwealth Caribbean, other than national parliaments that can create rights for national citizens. It also means that members of the executive, okay, the head of the executive, the heads of government, can reach, arrive at decisions at um, these regional conferences, and those decisions trump the laws made by national parliaments. Okay, so what, what conclusions uh, can we draw uh, from, from these recent judicial decisions. I imagine that political constitutionalists would be outraged by the decisions in Bowen and British Caribbean Banks Limited. Um, they would not readily accept that the power of a national parliament can be limited by something as nebulous as the concept of a basic structure. Uh, I think they would also uh, be outraged that uh, governments can take decisions at uh, regional conferences for which they may have no democratic mandate whatsoever, and yet those decisions can override laws enacted by uh, local parliaments. 
Legal constitutionalists, however, I imagine, would, will be cheering. Uh, they would see a, a decision in a case like Bowen as, as, as a vindication uh, by uh, the courts uh, and the only way that uh, individual rights can be prevented, uh, protected rather, uh, by a tyranny of the majority. I, I think legal constitutionalists would also probably applaud the decision uh, in Myri, and there they would say it was the government of Barbados's own fault. It, it entered into an undertaking that it would make sure that its national immigration laws were compatible with the decision it took at the regional uh, conference, and it was right for the Caribbean Court of Justice to hold the, the uh, government uh, of Barbados to account for and, and to ensure that it complied with that obligation. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 10 minutes for you to pose questions, and then we will give the panelists some time to respond. Percy? Um, yeah, um, the, the question is to Professor O'Brien. Uh, I'd, I'd like to raise, the, and without sort of getting into the issue of political and legal constitutionalism, I think there, there, there are other things that could be added. But look at um, the case of the United States in terms of legal constitutionalism and all of the sort of built-in checks and balances where the president um, um, appoints and the Senate confirms. And what we're seeing in the United States today is that um, you have... A, a particular type of um, sort of Republican um, ideological majority um, in the Supreme Court, and that Republican ideological majority is basically undermining um, the rights of the powerless and, and creating a, a sort of um, the, the, the power of, of, of capital. Um, in other words, um, even with legal constitutionalism, how does one then protect protect the legal system against the influence of powerful groups, um, even under conditions where you have checks and balances. Hamid Ghani, University of Western East St. Augustine. Uh, this is for Derek O'Brien. Um, those cases you cited from Belize, uh, was the board united uh, in, in all of those decisions, the board that heard the case, uh, you mentioned the opinion of the Chief Justice. Um, and uh, Belize did eventually uh, switch to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Uh, did any of those decisions uh, predate the switchover? And did they, did they go to the Privy Council or did they go ultimately to the Caribbean Court of Justice? Or was a judgment delivered in Belize and it stayed there? Uh, Clifford Griffin, NC State University. I also want to follow up that question in Belize um, that Hamid made. Because um, I was following this issue, and I'm one, I remember at the time, the IDB had a program in Belize to give property rights to, to Mayans. And, and so the, the question here was whether the Belize government was seeking to... Uh, I guess try to prevent um, advantage being taken of these mines. In other words, once you get the property rights, then you can sell that to some to anybody in the in the marketplace. And that this was an attempt to sort of protect uh, not only the mines but also protect the integrity of the country. So I, I was kind of I wonder if you sort of looked at that in your analysis. Uh, to that of the United States. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I came across as an advocate of legal constitutionalism, oh, yeah. and just because I'm a lawyer doesn't mean that I am. Um, but, uh, I I, and and I, I do, you know, I, I, would, I would absolutely agree with you that there is a danger that you just uh, replace a political elite with a judicial elite. And um, I don't think they're binary opposites. I, I, I mean, I'm 
would hope that you would find some kind of equili equilibrium. I was just slightly concerned. Um, I, I was conflicted with the, with the Bowen decision, particularly because of the very large parliamentary majority um, which, the, which the government enjoyed. And it, it was strange because it was a doctrine that this basic structure that came out of nowhere. I mean, it was, a, well, not out of in nowhere, but it was originally uh, invoked by the Indian Supreme Court back in the 70s. And this was the first time anybody had heard of it being put to use in the Commonwealth Caribbean. Um, the, the answer about the Belize is that, that, that it's very, very strange, um, those two cases in Belize, because they weren't court of appeal decisions. They were actually... Um, decisions of the Belize Supreme Court. One was by Chief Justice Conte in the first uh, case, and the second was by Justice Legal in the second case. So it wasn't, it wasn't a question of a divided majority or anything. They, they were single uh, judgments. And I, I think it's an interest... By, at least by the second case, uh, Belize had signed up to the Caribbean Court of Justice, and I think it is interesting that the government didn't take its uh, case to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Instead, it uh, you know, pushed ahead with this legislation. I don't know if that's because they think they would have lost uh, before the Caribbean Court of Justice. I don't know why they uh, ultimately abandoned these uh, constitutional reforms once they've been uh, struck down by the courts. Um, and uh, Clifford's point about the, the uh, property rights of Mayans, actually uh, one of the underlying themes of the Bowen case was the property rights of Mayans and uh, I think uh, most uh, observers think it was actually the court that was stepping in that uh, it was Chief Justice uh, Bowen was stepping in to protect the property rights of the Mayans uh, against uh, uh, an overweening uh, government because I don't think the government had made a, a lot of this uh, these deposits uh, were under land that was in Mayan community ownership so, uh, yeah. I have a question for I'm interested in the issue of convention, right? We had a very interesting case in St. Kitts and Nevis back in 1990, in which the, when um, uh, the electoral outcomes were, uh, the seats were evenly divided among parties, right? And so um, I think the Constitution calls for great subjectivity on the part of the Governor General, um, that he should appoint the person whom, in his judgment, he thinks is most likely to be able to get a majority in Parliament. And so you had a situation in which um, the, the Labour Party had four seats, the PAM had, PM had fewer seats, but had a potential for forming a coalition with the NRP over in Nevis. But Douglas, the Labour Party's argument was that in the national election, it got 43% of the vote, and so therefore, by virtue of having more of the popular vote, he should be, should be named sort of leader of the parliament. So this is one of the perverse outcomes, as you know, of this first-past-the-post system, right? This relationship, of weird relationship between seats and votes in terms of percentages. And so that imposes in those circumstances, you know, this great subjectivity on the part of uh, the Governor General in terms of convention. Do you see any parallels there? What are your thoughts on this whole issue of convention? Do they sort of reinforce? Do they um, provide um, the Parliament, the, the Westminster system, um, greater probity? What are your, some of your thoughts on that? Thank you. Unfortunately, I have a very unsatisfactory answer for you. Uh, that, from the cases I've looked at, at least, there's there's precedents that would say, especially give favoritism to the incumbent regime. From examples from the Pacific, especially, and um, I can't hear. Uh, sorry, that there are uh, precedents from the Pacific where the Governor General have utilised. Um, and see it as their role of supporting the incumbent regime, even if they, uh, after a general election, may have lost their majority. Nonetheless, they have the power of incumbency to be able to still control what happens afterwards. And so that's happened, uh, uh, and, and other sub-state sub, uh, level, at, at, say, for example, it's happened recently in Queensland, where the governor, the governor, 
of the state has utilized precedents from other Commonwealth states to help the uh, incumbent regime. And the other interesting precedent is where it can go the complete other way. For example, in Selangor at the moment, in Malaysia, the, uh, the, 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 head of st the regional head of state in Selangor, who's a traditional ruler, but still follows the Westminster model, when the, pr the Premier had to resign recently, and he's asked, the, the uh, traditional ruler has asked for two choices for, uh, for, to choose to, for the, to become the next Chief Minister. So asking, going, asking the political party, which has the majority in the Assembly, to put two choices, not they can't decide <laughs> who their leader should be, wants well, two. So just that these, for me that was interesting because it just shows that those presidents uh, can exist. For ex the same thing happened when Anthony Eden resigned and the Conservative Party at that time believed that the Queen should have two choices uh, for Prime Minister. So these things can go either way, depending on uh, the, the, the prejudices in some ways of the, of the Governor General or the Head of State themselves. It seems as if there are some more questions or comments. Hi, I'm Richard Drayton from King's College London. Um, Derek, one of the interesting themes that emerged at the last conference in London on the first day, I, I'm not sure if you were there for the first day, uh, I, was there, I was only there for the first day, um, was precisely uh, the question of how the colonial office in a very systematic way set about in the late 1950s, particularly in the early 1960s, in devising a kind of constitutional toolkit uh, which it would use in applying to the constitutions of uh, the states which it was about to uh, take over the threshold to constitutional uh, decolonization. And uh, essentially, this, this, the nature of the constitutions, what, what was proposed at that meeting? And I, I'm merely asking you if you could expand more on this theme. My recollection of the conversation was that uh, it was proposed by those who knew about this, which I, I don't know much about it, that one of the things the British did quite deliberately was to make it very difficult to have the constitution changed. <laughs> and they created some quite enormously high hurdles uh, for uh, regimes uh, uh, post-colonial regimes in the British Empire to change their constitutions, point one. Uh, having first uh, achieved that, they also then embedded in these constitutions things like property rights uh, and various other way, instruments through which essentially the, the pre-independence uh, order would, would, would be maintained. Uh, and I, I suppose I'd like to hear a bit more, if you know anything about this, of, about this kind of uh, initiative to kind of devise these ways through which the past would control the future in perpetuity. Kate Quinn, UCL. Um, this is just a, a, a comment on the Belizean case of the, the telecommunications company. Um, maybe the, the, the flip side of the case. This is the telecommunications company owned by Lord Ashcroft who you know, wanted to have a, a monopoly on telecommunications in Belize, and I think um, uh, in line with Professor Monroe's earlier point about the um, capture of the state by powerful financial interests, this case also illustrates um, or is a reminder of the, the power of very wealthy individuals with uh, very expensive lawyers who have been trying to write laws into, uh, 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 to get laws on the books uh, uh, that, that serve and defend their, their interests. So perhaps the Belize uh, uh, government there was a, uh, uh, is a case of the state um, defending itself against these uh, powerful economic interests. Since there don't seem to be any more questions, I'll ask the panelists. Um, oh. Not quite, no. Good. Um, uh, Professor Brooks, I, I, I don't quite know why you are being so bashful or diffident about describing yourself as a um, a member of the legal constitution in school um, um, be because the, uh, your, your position is quite defensible seems to me you know, the United Kingdom uh, um, is, is turning out to be and um, by next week perhaps will be less united than had been supposed now there, there are, I imagine, huge questions uh, um, sounding in, in the British Constitution, which is uh, 
primarily unwritten. And as regards which my understanding is, that it, it is what the judges say that the Constitution is, um, apart from statutes and the conventions and all that. But there are these huge questions which will fall to be determined. Um, in England, I think, uh, pri uh, primarily, in the event that a majority of the Scottish people were, were, were to determine that they wish to have their independence. Well, now, in, in, in that dreadful scenario, uh, and uh, by the way, I'm not unmindful about how all this might resonate on us here in the Caribbean. Uh, um, what, 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 what uh, role do you see the judiciary of, of uh, Great Britain, or what remains of it, uh, playing in um, determining eventually whether a majority of the Scottish people, if they wish uh, to, to secede from, from the former United Kingdom, it would have been, and, and, and to enjoy their independence. And how would that um, um, how, 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 how would that affect the will of a majority, if there is one, that uh, uh, voted for independence? the independence uh, constitutions. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose from the British government's point of view, it was a, 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 a journey into the unknown. And obviously, the, they were concerned about um, having any ordinary political majority seizing power and then completely ripping up uh, the independence constitutions. And uh, I, mean, I suppose, suppose the, ro the, the, the greater role model would be the US constitution, which is fairly rigid and quite difficult to amend. So it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't have been unusual uh, to require uh, par certain parliamentary majorities to change certain parts of the Constitution, uh, and, and particularly to try and entrench those bits that relate to Parliament, uh, to the judiciary, and to fundamental rights, and so on. Um, I, think it, I think what's odd is that in the early ones, it t they tended uh, simply to uh, permit amendment by a parliamentary majority, but in uh, later constitutions they required referendums as well. And I think that was the problem with the Belize uh, constitution, that if, that if that amendment had required a, the vote of the people at a referendum, the two-thirds majority there, I can't imagine uh, that the court would have, would have struck down uh, the amendment. Um, I, I, the property right, yeah, I, I, I understand uh, that that looks as though, I, I suppose it was, it was there partly to reassure, uh, you know, property-owning minorities in those former colonies that they were safe, uh, but I'm also sure, and if Professor Trevor Monroe was here, I'm sure he'd be able to tell us that uh, the, the other major reason was to attract investment in these countries. If, they, if, if, if foreign investors thought that they acquired property there, but that property wouldn't be safeguarded in the event of a change of government, there would be a concern that you wouldn't have got any uh, foreign in investments in these countries. Uh, the, the Belize and the Lord Ashcroft one, as, as I understand it, but, but I'm reading a spokesman for Lord Ashcroft, he claimed that he divested his ownership in uh, Brad British Caribbean banks uh, a, a long time uh, ago. And he said it was just a political maneuver by the U UDP to resurrect his name. And I'm not, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to defend Lord Ashcroft in any, in any way at all. But I, I, I think the problem with the, with the Bowen case is that I, I think the, uh, you know, the, the attempt to bring these utilities into public ownership may in itself have been laudable, but it was the amendments to the Constitution that followed on from it that uh, the, the objection was taken to. So it wasn't uh, particularly that they'd uh, 
uh, taken public un utilities into public ownership, but simply they would, the, the, the concern was if, if, if this is allowed and, and uh, the co courts can't do anything about it, what further amendments would there be to the Constitution and what protection would, would there then be? So, uh, and as I recall, that, that uh, same government uh, wanted to remove the right to trial by jury in murder cases, uh, for example. Um, so, I mean, that, that proposal was eventually withdrawn, and uh, I'm sure the Belize Supreme Court s saw itself as the uh, guardian of the Constitution. But it is this uh, tension between legal and political constitution. When you, uh, we, we had it in the UK in the 60s and 70s with the uh, court preventing sort of progressive um, legislation by, by the Labour government at, at the time. It's always been struck by, down by the courts. Um, in the interests of uh, big business and so on. And I, I think there is that concern uh, with legal constitutionalism uh, that it will defy the, the will of the people. Um, on, on the subject of uh, Scottish independence, I think I would imagine, um, because it's such a step into the unknown, I, I, I can't imagine the issue ever coming uh, before the English courts. I mean, I think the... You know, the, the, the legal questions that independence will throw up will, uh, you know, not so much be, it will, will in part be about the future relationship between England and Scotland, but it, I, I think these, the, you know, the more important questions are at the international level and, and particularly at the European level and whether Scotland can become a fully fledged member of the European Union, uh, whether it will have to uh, accept the euro and and so on. So I, I, can't, I, I honestly can't, I can't at the moment think of the legal question that would come before the English courts that they would be required to determine. Um, by the way, I neglected to introduce myself. My name is Earl Witter. Yeah. And that's what appears on my birth certificate. I'm, I'm not a peer of the realm. Let me make that plain. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there, there are questions relating to property. Um, either joint or exclusive ownership. Um, You're thinking of oil, uh, for, for example, uh, and and uh, and land. I believe. Uh, um, I'm sure I've heard of that. And 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 and, and um, there 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 there. Um, all right. I observe it is four o'clock. Could you just address those two, two areas? They, they, the, the, the question of um, property jointly owned and um, in, in particular the uh, residual rights to exploitation that might yet um, reside in um, Britain or what remains of it and or England. Yes. I, 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 I hesitate because I don't feel expert in this, in this field, but I understand that as a, as a matter of international law, any jointly owned assets will then um, be acquired by the remaining states of it. So, so, the, so, so not only the UK, but the remainder of the Great, Great Britain will then uh, acquire ownership of any jointly owned assets rather than uh, Scotland. Um, I'm afraid I might have to assert my right as chair <laughs> because we are, we are running out of time and I have strict instructions that um, we have to stop by a certain time in order to prepare for the address by Dr. Gonzalez at five o'clock. Um, I mean, it requires a yes or no answer. <coughs> because I was thinking that a lot of these can be discussed afterwards in the corridors. I was going to, I wanted to give Hashan a chance to say something finally. Um, I'm sure you don't want to speak about Scotland, but you might have to. <laughs> and then I will, I'm craving the indulgence of everybody else who wants to ask questions to follow it up in the corridors, please. Uh, very quickly, just responding to what Richard asked, um, Derek, of the constitu different constitutions I've seen of the different models in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, yeah. There is often very peculiar insertions where there's different geopolitical uh, things at play. For example, in the Ceylon case, because it was a very strategic uh, Cold War era place and seen as more 
conservative compared to its neighbours. It was instilled in the constitution that the Prime Minister would also be Minister of Defence and External Affairs to make sure that the ports were stayed, stayed British. Uh, and also, um, and, and interestingly, that particular case, which is a, also a big element in almost all Commonwealth countries, ethnicity and ethnic representation. Interestingly, and it came up in your paper as well, the, one of the few groups that got, uh, even though the British generally rejected ethnic representation in, in Parliament, uh, there, there was always the nominated uh, members, but they almost invariably went to planters. Uh, and but uh, interestingly, from all these different cases uh, from uh, Africa as well as Asia, often went back, even though there's no constitution, constitutional reason to do so, went to Britain to ask, "What do we do in this case?" And then you'd, they'd get a, it'd be a, you know a, a selected set of papers, de depending on what the British thought would be most beneficial for the outcome for them. And uh, in regards to Scotland, to stop. Scotland becoming a new Westminster itself with a Governor General Balmoral. <laughs> That's all. Okay. Um, well, the only thing left to do is to thank the panelists for very interesting presentations. And I would also like to thank the audience for a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to reassemble here at 5 o'clock for uh, uh, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez's keynote address. In the meantime, make yourselves comfortable, relax, and we come back here at 5. Thank you.